Um, welcome. Thank you for joining us for day three of the Women's Policy Leadership Institute. My name is Ella. And my pronouns are she, her, hers. And we are really excited that you've all joined us today for navigating the legislature in 2021. The Women's Policy Leadership Institute is a program of Montana Women Vote. Um, and we are a statewide organization working to engage low income women and families, LGBTQ folks, two spirit and non binary folks, black, indigenous, and people of color and their allies in the democratic process as informed voters, policy advocates, and community leaders. We are really grateful to have you all here today. We hope that the information will inform your efforts in your community and your efforts to engage in the legislative session. And we're excited to stay connected with you as we work together to advance state policy that works for low income folks in Montana. So before we get started, I just want to give a few brief notes on participating in today's event. As you join, you will be muted automatically, but you can unmute yourself by clicking the microphone icon at the bottom left-hand corner of your screen. And if you're using your phone to join us today, you can unmute yourself by pressing star six. However, if you are accidentally unmuted or if we're having some background noise, one of our hosts may mute you just for accessibility purposes to make sure that everybody can hear and that our captions are working well. Um, so you can definitely unmute yourself again if we end up muting you, but that may happen. So just as an FYI, we encourage you to ask questions and talk with other participants using the chat feature. Um, if you want to say where you're joining us from today in the chat, then maybe other people in your area might be able to connect with you. You can submit questions by typing them into the chat box at any time during the workshop and we will review questions and pass them along um, as we have time and we may wait to answer some of them until the end. And you have the option to turn on captions or turn them off and adjust the size by clicking on the CC button at the bottom of your home screen. And I believe that that chat information is also being entered into the, or the CC information is also in the chat box. If you have questions or technical difficulties at any time, you can put them into the chat box or give our staff a call at 406-317-1505. And we will also put that phone number into the chat box. We are recording today's session. So if you miss something, recordings will be provided on our website along with any materials that we use. And at the end, we ask that you complete a short evaluation and let us know your thoughts. So we'll talk about that a little bit at the end of today's session. You might be entered to win a fun prize. So that is the vast majority of our technical info. So thank you all again for joining us. Um, we have a few things that we wanna cover today. Um, so our goals for the workshop are firstly to demystify the legislative process and share information on how the process works. We also want to give you all some concrete tools, including vocabulary and the legislative website to be able to use while you're navigating the legislative session. And we wanna prepare you to engage and influence the 2020, 2021 legislative session. Um, two for Rachel for the vocab list. One thing that we don't have time to go over today, but is probably going to be helpful in um, engaging with some of this content is our legislative vocabulary list, which Rachel is putting into the chat box. And we will drop it into the chat box again later on in the training. So feel free to check out that vocabulary list and um, I'll reference that again later. So we'll start off with understanding the legislative process and what's behind the curtain, and then we'll move into how to impact the process, how to support or kill bills, and how to shift the balance of power. And then hopefully we'll have a few minutes at the end for some questions or discussion. So thank you so much, and I'll turn it over to Howell to talk a little bit about the legislative process. All right, thank you so much, Ella. I'm gonna run, um, fairly quickly through a sort of basic foundation of Montana State Legislature and how things work. 
Um, so uh, this is background info that I think a lot of folks will know, but um, you know, we have a hundred legislative districts, a hundred representatives and 50 senators. Every representative in the house represents one district with about 10,000 people. And then senators represent a district that is two house districts combined into one Senate district. So about 20,000 people. Um, our legislature meets every two years for 90 working days. And this is um, actually different from a lot of other states that meet every year. Um, so our legislative sessions are really quite fast paced, um, considering that there's 18 months between each legislative session. Representatives serve two year terms and senators serve four year terms and all legislative elections take place on even numbered years. So every even numbered year, 2022, 2024, 2026 and so forth, every representative in the house is up for election or re-election and senators are up every other election for four year terms. We also have term limits in Montana, um, also somewhat unique in terms of um, state legislatures. And our term limits are eight-year term limits for each chamber. So you can serve um, four uh, sessions in the House and four sessions in the Senate um, under those term limits. Um, this is a map of what our legislative districts look like. Um, I think this is useful um, to note that many of our districts, especially in the eastern half of the state and in some of those rural areas, are really quite large. And um, our seven larger communities are split into much smaller sort of urban districts. Um, this map is available online uh, for folks who want to spend more time poring over it. Um, so every legislator is assigned to committees, um, depending on the, the division between Democrats and Republicans, most legislators serve on between two and four committees. Um, these are the, the committees in the House and the Senate. It's worth noting that the committees in the House and Senate basically match up, but they often have very slightly different names. So, for example, you'll see here that House, the first uh, committee on the list in the House is House Agriculture Committee. In the Senate, it's Agriculture, Livestock, and Irrigation. They'll hear the same bills, basically the same committee slightly different names. Another one that's good to note is appropriations. The appropriations committee, it's called the appropriations committee in the house and finance and claims in the Senate. Same committees serve the same function, which is to um, hear bills that spend money or appropriate money, um, but different names. So just one of those slightly more complicated than it needs to be. Um, things about our state legislature. Um, committees are a really important um, place where bills are first heard and where the bulk of the work in terms of amendments um, or any substantive changes to bills are usually done. And the committee structure is a really important way, both in terms of how bills move in terms of where and how engage with bills. I'll talk more about that later, but just as a note. The legislature also has leadership. Um, there's leadership um, on, for, in both parties and in chambers of uh, the legislature. And I've listed here um, this year 2020's leadership um, in the House and the Senate. And basically, um, the Speaker of the House and the Minority Leader are sort of the top leaders from the Majority Party and Majority Party. 
and similarly in the Senate, the president of the Senate Minority Leader. Uh oh, one of those technical difficulties. Um, I, I think we may have just uh, lost Howell. So hopefully they will. No, you're all good. <laughs> I'm so sorry. Um, I think that my internet just quit. Uh, can you? Oh, there we go. Let's see if we can uh, start this back up. Really sorry about that, everyone. Um, internet, isn't it the worst? Um, okay, leadership. Leadership does a number of important things. They assign commit, they give committee assignments to other members of the legislature. They, um, they assign bills to certain committees. So they really do have quite a lot of behind the scenes power in how things work. Um, timeline. So I said um, 90 days, 90 working days. Um, the session usually starts the first week of January and goes through the end of April. Um, there's a calendar up online. Um, the session starts meeting Monday through Friday and then we'll add in Saturdays, usually somewhere in February. Um, and those days are pretty full. Committee hearings usually start at 8. Um, there are morning committee hearings and then floor sessions at 1 p.m. every day and then afternoon committee hearings um, usually starting around 3 that go until 5 or 6. Um, there's a break halfway through. Um, called transmittal. And uh, this is both important, one, because it's a little bit of a breather and folks can take a break, but it's also a really important deadline. Transmittal deadline is a, a deadline for when bills must be halfway through the process and transmitted or sent from either the House to the Senate or vice versa. I will say some of those deadlines are a little bit later, um, depending on what type of bill they, they are. But for the bulk of bills, um, if they haven't passed either the House or the Senate by transmittal, they will die in the process. They just haven't met the deadline. So that is sort of a whirlpool run um, with a brief internet breakdown of the basics of our legislative session. And I'm going to turn it over to Ella to dig in a little bit more on the state budget and then how a bill becomes a law. Thank you so much, Howell. So the most fun part of this workshop every time we present it is always talking about the state budget, which may sound boring, but it's incredibly important for every community that accesses funds through the state and for all of our work. Um, so the Montana legislature's first and most important job is to pass a budget. They are statutorily required to pass a budget. And because the legislature meets only every two years, they pass what's called a biennial budget, which means it's a budget that spans over two years. Um, and the budget process starts about a year before the legislative session begins. Last year's budget was about $10 billion total. $4 billion of that is Montana revenue. $4.5 billion is federal funds, so funding coming into the state from the federal government. And $1.5 billion of that budget is considered other. Um, and so a little bit more about the timeline. The budget process begins with agency budget requests. So state agencies such as the Montana Department of Corrections, the Montana Department of Health and Human Services, they make their budget requests. And then those requests go to the governor's office. So then the governor creates the governor's budget, which is typically released on December 15th. And the governor's budget becomes what's known as House Bill 2. Um, if you've engaged with the legislature at all, you'll know that most bills are given a name, House Bill X or Senate Bill X. 
but the budget is always House Bill 2. And then once the governor's budget is entered into the legislature as House Bill 2, the legislative fiscal division will present an analysis. And they have to present this before the first day of the legislative session. And the legislative fiscal division division's analysis breaks the budget down into three different categories. The base budget, which is ongoing funding to keep the state and its departments functioning. The present law adjustment. So what the heck is present law adjustment? Basically, that is what is agency specific budget adjustments. So either more money or less money that are needed to maintain services at the level approved by the legislature since the previous budget. So this could include changes in the number of people served by the Department of Corrections, for example, or it could also be the number of seniors or individuals with disabilities accessing nursing homes or community services through the Department of Health and Human Services. So those are just two examples of some pieces of uh, funding that could end up in the present law adjustment and then the third category is new proposals. So those three categories make up the legislative fiscal division, divisions analysis. And then joint subcommittee hearings of the legislature will um, consider this analysis and consider House Bill 2 and um, make reconciliations of any budgetary things that are passed in the legislative session before the legislature will then pass the overall budget after they've made all sorts of changes and adjustments to it throughout the legislative session. And then they'll pass the budget at the end, typically very near the end of the legislative session. So that's a lot of information um, and we still have a lot more to cover today. So if you do have questions on the budget, please feel free to put those into the chat and we would love to dig in more and answer a few of them at the end. But for now, I would love to just talk to you a little bit more about how a bill becomes a law. So this is one of the most, um, most asked questions that we get from people as we're talking about the legislative session is how do you go from identifying a need in your community or having an idea or seeing a problem um, and then how does that get translated into actual policy? So basically how a bill becomes a law is you may start out as an individual um, with an idea. Typically, if you are someone who's sort of outside of the legislative process, then you may wanna ally yourself with an organization or with a legislator. And we'll talk a little bit about that later. Um, and once somebody who is sort of involved with the legislature has that idea in hand, then they will put it into bill form and the bill will be introduced. Once the bill is introduced, it will be drafted and it will be referred to a committee, either in the House or the Senate. And things sort of progress through the process at just about the same way if they're started in the Senate or the House. It just depends on whether or not the original sponsor of the bill is a senator or a representative. So if the bill sponsor is a representative, it'll start in the House. And if it's a senator, it'll start in the Senate. And it'll be referred to a committee, typically a committee that is um, most, has most authority over the subject matter of the bill. So if it's a law enforcement bill, it will probably go to House Judiciary or Senate Judiciary, for example. Once it's referred to a committee, it will be scheduled for a committee hearing. This is the one time in the process of a bill that um, the public is allowed to engage and make public comment, share our experiences, and talk about legislation um, directly with lawmakers is in that committee hearing. So it's referred to a committee, it has a hearing, people make their voices heard, and then the committee will take what's called executive action. So the committee will take a vote on the bill and they will either, the bill will die, the committee will vote to table it, which basically means they're not going to pass it on further, or they will pass the bill to the full body. So if the Senate Judiciary Committee, for example, passes a bill, then it will go on to the Senate floor, which is the full body of the Senate. 
And then the Senate will vote on that bill twice in what's called second reading and third reading. Um, second reading typically includes a sometimes robust debate. So lawmakers will debate the merits or lack thereof on the floor. Um, and the floor is just sort of when they can be convene as a full body. Um, and then once that debate is concluded, they will take a vote in what's called second reading. If it passes second reading, it will move on to third reading, which does not include debate. It's just a straight up vote. So they don't really talk about the merits of the bill. They just vote on it one more time. Um, and then if it passes third reading, it will move on to what's called or it will move over into the other body. So a bill has to be passed by both bodies of the legislature. So if it started in the Senate and it passes the Senate, it'll move over to the House and it'll do the whole process all over again. Um, and everything that I just described happens exactly the way that it happened on the other side, on the new side, including a second opportunity for a hearing and a second opportunity for public comment. If it passes both bodies, then it may go into what's called a conference committee. A conference committee typically reconciles any amendments or changes that may have been made by one body or the other. So if the Senate made amendments to a bill that the House didn't have the opportunity to vote on, a conference committee is how that is then reconciled. Um, there are occasions where additional votes have to be taken um, and there's some complicated things that happen in the rules sometimes. And then once the bill is passed and all of that is taken care of, it will move to the desk of the governor. And the final decision maker at that point is the governor who has the opportunity to either veto or sign a law, a bill into law. Um, there is one technicality which is called an amendatory veto where the governor will say, I am going to veto this bill now, but I would sign it if this happened. Um, and then sometimes the legislature will have the opportunity to tweak the bill and send it back to the governor. But if it, typically you're going to see either a veto, which means the governor says no, or a governor signing the bill, which means that bill is becoming a law. I think I covered everything. How, how did I do? <laughs> you did great. Um, okay, so we're going to dive into how you engage with the legislative session, both what's going on this year and how you figure it out, and also some of the best ways to influence the process. I'll just say again, um, if you have questions, put those into the chat and we will, um, we will make sure we get to them. So everybody knows I presume that this year's legislative session is different from any other. Um, it is a hybrid session, which means there is um, in person, an in-person legislative session going on um, where legislators, legislative staff, lobbyists, and uh, everyday Montanans are gathering in person in the building, in the Capitol building in Helena for committee hearings, floor sessions, etc. And there is um, also a remote or virtual option for all of that. So some legislators are um, participating remotely. Um, there is a Zoom system set up. So every hearing room has a big TV screen and you have some legislators on Zoom and some in the in the room. Um, folks are participating in hearings and giving testimony um, both in person and remotely. And most committee hearings sort of go back and forth. You know, first they'll do in the room and then they'll go to online or some version like that. And similarly, on the floor, um, there are legislators on the floor, the House or the Senate floor, and online. Um, so in some ways, this makes actually more opportunity for folks to um, engage because you don't have to travel to Helena. Um, but it's also just a little bit complicated to figure out. So I'm going to run through some of the ways you can do that online. 
First thing to know is this homepage that's up on your screen right now. And that URL at the top is the, um, the URL to the, to the page, um, ledge.mt.gov. And on this page, you'll find um, all of the important links. On the left-hand side, you'll see bill search, and we'll go to that next. Um, there's also legislator search, so how you can find who your legislator is, or just look up key legislators and find their contact information. This big um, sort of word bubble in the middle that says have your say is important, and right down below it where it says request to testify remotely is also important because that's how you can sign up to testify virtually. And then up at the top, um, right in the middle, it says watch and listen. And that's a, a, a link to where you can stream committee hearings or floor sessions if you're not um, testifying in them. So lots of, uh, lots of good information on this page. Let's start off with um, looking up bills. So the, the bill, search function in Montana is called laws. And that's the, the URL there, laws.ledge.mt.gov. And you get a page that looks something like this. Um, this is actually, I took this snapshot before, um, before this session started. So this says 2019 up top. If you click the link now, it'll say 2021. And there's a couple different ways that you can look up bills. The easiest way is if you know the bill number and you'll choose either HB, which stands for House Bill, or SB, which stands for Senate Bill. Um, from this little drop down menu, there's also HJ, which is House Resolution, and SJ, and so forth. And then you put the bill number into the little box and you click Find, and it'll pop up the information on the bill. There's usually a list of the bill and the date that it was requested and introduced and a little hyperlink at the top where you can click on to see bill language. You can also search for bills by legislators. So if you know the legislator that's introducing the bill but you don't know the bill number, you can choose from the whole list of legislators and it'll pop up all the bills that that legislator has requested or introduced. Um, or subject. And subject is interesting and um, useful if you are interested, for instance, in all of the bills that have been introduced on, let's say, um, gun control. So you'd select a subject. I think there's one that says guns, um, and it'll pull up all of the bills that have that uh, subject, either in the title or in the, the body of the bill. That is also um, sometimes quite overwhelming. Sometimes there's not very many bills on that list, but sometimes you'll pull up 40, 50, 100 bills or more. Um, just for reference, this legislative session, there were over 3,000 bills requested by legislators. Not all of those will make it into a bill draft that's introduced and moved through the system, but many will. So it's often... Um, searching through a long, long list um, that isn't super fun to work with. But still, this is an important tool. Um, you can also look up bills after they're, they've started moving through the system and you can see the vote counts on them and who's voted on those bills um, and more. So lots of good information there. Um, a couple quick questions. Um, thanks for the links to other tools. Um, I, I think the more tools that are out there, the better. This is the sort of official one, so I think it's good for folks to know about it, but uh, the free press tool is great. There's also private tools like Bill Tracker and things like that. A um, couple quick, quick questions that I'm going to um, answer quickly. Hearings and floor sessions are recorded and they go into an archive. And you can usually, um, under this watch and listen, there's an archive fun um, search function. And so you can go back and search for hearings that you may have missed. 
Um, if a bill is tabled in committee, um, it's it's d considered dead unless the committee either votes to take it off the table themselves or the full body blasts it, which is a vote on the House floor to bring it out of committee. Um, I do not know that there is a function where you can search keywords in the body of bills, but the subject list is quite extensive. So I would start there um, and you may find that what you're trying to search is available on that subject list. And um, great question from Jackie, who decides if a bill request becomes a draft and gets introduced. So um, the legislator who's requesting it is really in control of that process. So a legislator will put in a request. Sometimes those requests are just um, placeholders. And then it's up to that legislator to um, move the process forward. They can put the bill draft on hold. They can take it off hold. And at the end, they that legislator has a drafted piece of legislation that they physically introduce, and then it goes into the process. Um, everything that happens before that bill is introduced is up to the individual legislator and their decision making. Couple last quick things. Um, live streaming, again, this is a good way to watch um, committee hearings. I'll just note that this was an, an interim committee hearing from January of last year, so pre-COVID. That's why they're all sitting so closely together. Um, I hope that sometimes it looks different. Um, and this is, you know, this is really useful to go back and see um, how bills or issues are being discussed. Um, finding your legislator, um, this is a good way to look up a legislator by address, by name. You can, look, um, you can look up the whole list of legislators, and almost all legislators have one or more ways of contacting them. Um, you can contact legislators by phone, email, regular mail, or even fax, which is remarkable. Um, the switchboard, I love the switchboard. Um, lots of people think that I'm a little old school for this, but I love the switchboard. And here's why. Here's the secret to the switchboard. You call up and you talk to very nice switchboard operators, not your legislators. And those folks will write down your message word for word, make sure that you've got the bill number right, give it to the committee or legislator that you want. They'll help you look up your legislator if you don't know who they are. They're super great and helpful. Um, you should save that number in your phone, um, like Ella is prompting us to do, 444-4800. And this is, like, it just makes it so easy to call up and say, I want to leave a message for the Senate Tax Committee opposing SB 159, or... I want to leave a message for my legislator about whatever, and and those messages will get passed on to your legislator either on a slip of paper or in their email. Um, and it really is fast. It's easy. You can do it when you're out walking or at the grocery store. Um, you can also do do it through this link here, which will send them an email. Equally as effective. Um, but I, I'm a big a big fan of the the switchboard. Um, okay, so that is a fast and dirty overview of how you, in, you, how you can engage. I want to talk just a little bit about why we engage and how to be strategic and actually make those contacts have, a, have an impact on the process. So again, as Ella went through, here's the process. Um, and I'll just say up front, there are lots of ways in which our legislative process and our legislative system is not built for regular people. It's not built for people without power, wealth, and privilege. But that doesn't mean that we can't or shouldn't influence the process. And in fact, we have to. And when we influence the process, we're not just changing the outcome of legislation. I think that we're actually chipping away at that balance of power. And it's so important that we do it 
every day of every legislation, legislative session of every year or every other year. Um, so I wanna just talk a little bit about where, where the best and most strategic ways to engage are. Um, if you wanna give testimony, the only place that the public can speak onto the record on a bill is during a committee hearing. Only legislators can speak on the floor. So committee hearings, um, if your bill is moving, you'll get one in the House and one in the Senate, or sometimes a little bit more. Um, if your bill uh, costs money or spends money, you'll get usually um, like an issue committee hearing and an appropriations hearing. Um, sometimes it doesn't work that way. But committee hearings are our opportunity to get on the public record and really um, share information with legislators. And I think that they're really, really important. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about how to give testimony. So this is what the, the online webpage looks like if you wanna testify remotely. Um, the, the, the good news is that you can sign up to testify on any bill that you want and multiple bills a day. The bad news is that you have to register in advance uh, by noon the day before. Um, and that can be a little bit of a barrier, especially when things move quickly. Um, I'll note a couple of things. If there are um, Monday hearings, you can register up until noon on Sunday. So it is the calendar day before you don't have to register for Monday hearings on Friday. Um, when you register, uh, you'll be asked to provide a little bit of information, your name, email, phone number, and the city you live in. There is an opportunity to submit testimony in writing or upload a document. And this is really great if you have something that you want to share um, that you want in the public record as testimony, but you can't physically be there or you don't want to be. That's actually a new thing this year that you can submit um, testimony and writing through the website. And that is printed out and given to committee members as testimony. But if you want to testify over Zoom, at the very bottom of the page, it will say, uh, do you want to testify? And you'll hit yes. And it'll say, how are you joining by computer or by phone? And you provide that information. Um, you should get an immediate email back. It's like an auto email that just says, yes, we've gotten your information. If you don't get that immediately, something went wrong and you should just try the process again. And then at some point, um, the day before usually, or maybe the morning of your hearing, you'll get an email from the Zoom staffer for the committee and it'll have a link. Um, it'll say, do not forward this link, sort of one link per person. And you'll get to click the link. Um, you'll go into a Zoom chat that um, looks very familiar to all of us. A couple things to know about um, Zoom testimony, you don't have video. They, um, they're not having anyone or allowing anyone to turn their video on. So, you know, the, the nice thing is you don't have to brush your hair. Um, and you will basically be called on. So the other thing that's a little tricky is that you don't always know exactly when it's gonna be your turn to testify. You're sort of waiting, they start going through online proponents or opponents. And at some point somebody will say, up next, Ella Smith. And a button will pop up on your screen that says unmute. And you'll hit that unmute button and then you'll be able to give your testimony. Oh. Sorry, here's the other half of this page. Um, you do have to select the bill. That was an important piece of information I shouldn't skip. When you sign up to testify, you sign up bill by bill. So you select a bill from the, the list and then um, go from there. Um, how you testify at a hearing. So there is a little bit of um, process involved in all of this. Um, and you know this is 
fairly important um, in that um, everyone is sort of required to follow the, the process. And if you don't, the, um, the chair will often interrupt you. So a couple things. It's good idea to arrive early under normal circumstances, log in early under Zoom circumstances, five minutes, 10 minutes early. It doesn't have to be more than that. Really good idea to prepare testimony before the hearing, write it down or at least make notes. It's nice not to read your testimony. I think legislators prefer um, not to be read to. Um, but again, do what makes you most comfortable. Um, if you're going in person, you know, for years in the future, we like to, to tell folks that there is a, there is sort of an unwritten dress code in the Capitol. It's actually a written dress code for legislators. Um, and it, it's helpful to dress in a way that makes you feel comfortable in that setting. Um, usually, like, business wear is nice enough. It doesn't have to be super fancy. Um, and, you know, there are people who will testify in, in jeans and boots and hats. So do what you please. And of course, if you're on video, again, it doesn't matter. And then use legislative hearing protocol. And that's what's down here at the bottom of the screen. Um, our legislature use what, uses what's called um, Mason's rules, which are sort of like Robert's rules. It's a parliamentary procedure. Um, and basically what you do is you first say, um, you know, Mr. Chair or Madam Chair, and then members of the committee. So you always start by acknowledging the chair. Um, so, you know, Madam Chair, members of the committee, my name is S.J. Howell, that's spelled H-O-W-E-L-L, -L, and they really do want you to spell out at very least your last name or your whole name. Um, they're pretty strict about having everyone spell their name, and that's, again, for the public record because things are recorded. And then you want to let the committee know um, if you're representing an organization or a community, um, who that is, um, and then name the bill and whether you're supporting or opposing. So something like, you know, Mr. Chair, members of the committee, my name is Ajay Bull, that's A-O-W-E-L-L. -L. I'm the director of Montana Women Vote, speaking to you from Missoula, and I rise today in support of HB 228. And then you give your testimony. Um, and most everyone This is actually just a fun little game that we're playing. Um, we have all taken bets on how many um, technical issues that we'll have, and I'm pretty sure that I'm winning five dollars. So back to you, Hal. I'm so sorry, everyone. This is the worst. Um, I will just say that um, people cut out during testimony all the time as well. So it's like the new, um, like dropping your note cards on your way to the podium or something. I don't know. Anyway, my apologies. So testifying at a hearing. Um, the last thing is just being prepared to answer questions. Rare if you're there telling a personal story or just noting your supporter position that you will get a question. But there is sort of an expectation that you, if you testify at a hearing, that you will be around until the end of the hearing to answer questions um, just in case. If you know that you can't stay, you can also ask um, if you can be excused because you have to get back to work or whatever, and usually that's okay. Um, but if you are asked a question, the same protocol um, applies. Someone will say, I have a question for Ella Smith, and Ella will unmute or stand up at the podium and say, Mr. Chair, Representative, thanks for the question, and then they'll, they'll answer the question. Um, okay. Whew. That was a little bit of a, um, a sprint. 
through all of that. Um, a couple things I do want to note, um, engaging in the session is important and fun. I think personally, and this is an organizational value that um, decisions shouldn't be made and laws shouldn't be made um, about that impact people's lives without those people's voices and stories present in the decision making space. We feel that pretty strongly. Um, and at the same time, that is not the only way to influence legislation. And in fact, um, if all we did was just to go up and testify, I actually think we would not get much done. So here are other things that need to happen. Calling, writing letters, sending emails to legislators are actually really, really important. Um, folks may know um, we had terrible anti-trans bill to them, one still alive, but one HB 13 would have prevented uh, young people from access to gender affirming health care. Um, that bill died on the floor, on the House floor, and one legislator told me that she had received 4,000 contacts opposing that bill, and that was one of the reasons that she felt committed to voting no. This was a Republican legislator. So those contacts matter. They tell legislators that their constituents are paying attention, that these issues are important to them, and that, um, you know, that their constituents who vote them in or out of office um, want them to, to vote a certain way. Um, so again, organizing a phone bank where you call your friends and encourage them to call their legislators, um, getting the word out, however you do it on your social media, all really important. Writing letters to the editor is also great. Um, and I know that there are some folks who, um, who think that only so many letters to editors will be published on certain issues. The truth is the more that are submitted, the more get published. We found this to be true on a lot of different issues. So if you, uh, if you have a itchy pen finger, I'd say crank those letters out whenever you feel like it, it's important. Um, and then personal story. Um, to um, emphasize the impact of the votes that legislators are taking. They're also um, a great tool in making legislators feel embarrassed or guilty or trap votes, and that's actually a powerful tool, even though we shouldn't have to resort to it. So personal stories are um, also really, really useful. Um, and I believe, oh, so here's a slide, uh, the stuff nobody tells you about. And the truth is that it, this session, a lot of this doesn't apply, but these are, these are tips and tricks that I learned over years and years and years of lobbying. And I figured, uh, since we have time, I want to make sure there's time for questions and discussion, but since we have time, I might just uh, run through this really quickly. Some of it still applies. Some of it, you can keep it in your pocket for next session. Um, if you want to talk to a legislator, it's really quite hard to schedule a meeting or an appointment. A lot of times it's just about catching legislators when you can. And that's partly because the days are packed um, and also partly because Sometimes legislators don't want to be caught. Um, but a couple of things that are really useful, stairwells, outside committee rooms, um, you know, lurking around the entrance to the House and the Senate chamber, all good places to catch legislators. A lot of times what you have to do is find a legislator and then walk with them to the next place they're going so you can take a couple minutes to chat. Um, if somebody's sitting on the, the floor um, when there's not a floor um, session going on, um, there are legislative pages. They're usually high school students um, who go to spend a week um, paging at the legislature. And there's sort of a <clears throat> unwritten, um, actually, I actually think it is written now at this point. There's a 
a process where you can write a note to a legislator, including a note that says, can you step out into the hallway and chat with me? And for a dollar, the page will run it um, out to the floor for that legislator. Um, there's good information to be found at the info desk and the sergeant at arms if you're in person. Um, and, you know, also under normal circumstances, lots of free food. Um, there's a cafeteria in the basement and a third floor coffee bar. Again, this is for the future. Um, and a couple other things just to note about the building. Um, there is a bill library in the basement. They will print things for you. So if you have a hard time finding something or you, you know, don't have internet access, they will look something up and print it out for you. It does cost some money, but not a lot. Um, like most other libraries and librarians, they're very helpful in the basement. Um, if you want to watch the floor, the House or Senate floor session in person, there are galleries up above, but it's good to know that you can't take food or drink or backpacks into that gallery, although you can take just about any other type of bag with you. Um, if you are a person who appreciates gender neutral or single stall bathrooms, there are bathrooms in the basement that are single stall. Um, so that's really useful. None of the other bathrooms are. And there is a fourth floor bathroom that has a, a nursing room, um, which is good to know if you would need to nurse or pump or need a minute of privacy. Um, and the last thing that, uh, that I learned that is probably the most important lesson that I've learned as a lobbyist is that nobody successfully works the session alone. Even if you just want to engage on one bill or one issue that, that is most important to you, finding other people who are working on those bills or issues, sharing information, getting a text thread going, um, supporting one another, that's really the way that we make an impact on the session. Um, so, you know, again, I hope someday the tips about the third floor coffee bar are, are more useful. Um, but for now, that's that's some of the the lessons we've learned um, over the years. So I'm actually going to stop sharing my screen and hope that maybe my internet won't die because of that. Um, and we do have about 20 minutes for um, questions and comments. So Ella, are there any questions you want to immediately address um, from the there chat? Was one, there was one early on that I think maybe um, I decided to put off towards the end. I wasn't able to write a written response. So when um, leadership censors folks or does not allow testimony from a particular member of the public or a legislator, is there um, any way to push back against that? Is there a parliamentarian or some sort of recourse available? Um, so that's a really good question and uh, has likely come up because that's been happening a great deal this session, um, even though it shouldn't. Um, there isn't a lot of recourse. You can file a complaint, um, and I believe that the complaint is filed with legislative leadership, so um, Speaker of the House or, or Senate President, depending on whether it happened in the House or Senate. Um, the, the best way to address it, um, unfortunately for us, is sort of in the moment, um, with other legislators objecting and trying to, to stop the censorship. And um, sometimes that works and sometimes it doesn't. Um, you know, sometimes legislators are ready to step in and do that and, and sometimes they're not. Um, but unfortunately, that is, um, it is a sort of challenging situation. There's not a lot that can be done in the moment. Um, I will say it is, uh, there's never any excuse for that kind of censorship. Um, 
And at the same time, um, it's often, we are often more effective if we um, really tailor our comments to the bill so that uh, even if folks are objecting, you know, other legislators can step in and say, this is on the bill, this is important. Um, I actually just had um, a committee chair tell me I was off the bill in a hearing this morning. It happens more often than you would think. Sometimes you just have to kind of power through. Um, what other questions? do folks have or comments, um, things that we didn't cover that you want to hear about? And if you'd rather just unmute yourself and ask your question verbally, that is totally acceptable. Oh, I see a couple good questions about written testimony. Um, one, can you submit a uh, written testimony after the fact? Um, you can. The best way to do it is to email it to the, um, the committee staff person, um, but it may not be submitted into the public record if you do that. So it's best to do it um, before or during the hearing. The other thing is that you can submit written testimony like just directly in an email to legislators um, if need be. And an ideal length for written testimony, this is a great question. Um, I would say unless you have specific expertise, keep it to a page. If it's your personal story, um, you know, and you can you can edit it down and keep it to about a page or less, it ups the chance that it's going to be fully read. If you have specific um, expertise and you are, um, you know, sharing statistics and facts and figures, I think you can push it to two pages. Submitting much more than that, I think that you are pushing your chances that it will get read, unfortunately. Um, How old? If you are speaking from experience volunteering somewhere, does this count as lobbying? Oh, good question. Um, so any, uh, any testifying where you ask legislators to vote a certain way on a bill technically is defined as lobbying. The definition of lobbying is making a request of a decision maker about a specific piece of legislation. Um, if you are volunteering and you're not getting paid, then it doesn't count as lobbying in that um, it doesn't have to be reported anywhere. You don't have to register as a lobbyist. You're just, you're just a, a citizen lobbyist. And um, even if you are not allowed to lobby um, for your job, um, you should still, under most circumstances, be allowed to lobby as an individual. Um, so, yes, it does technically count as lobbying um, to testify, but if you're a, a citizen doing it, then it doesn't count in any in any sort of measurable or reportable way. Does that answer the question, whoever had it? Uh, yeah, I think it does, thank you. Great. Um, so this is a good question from Mallory about how many testimonies are heard per, per committee hearing. Um, so this is a little bit tricky and it really comes down to time. Um, it depends how many bills are being heard per uh, in, in the hearing, sometimes there'll be just one bill being heard. Sometimes you'll have four bills being heard at one time. Um, usually, so I would say most committees have somewhere between two and four hours that they're going to hit give to each hearing. Um, so if you have, uh, let's say, two bills being heard, and there is 
um, three hours allotted. That's an hour and a half for each bill. Usually the chair will leave at least half an hour for questions from the committee. So that's an hour for testimony and usually they'll split that in half or try to gauge how many proponents and opponents there are and split time up that way. The truth is that all of those decisions are at the discretion of the chairperson of the committee. So if you have a chairperson who, you know, is friendly or cares about sort of the fairness of the proceedings, then they'll, they'll try to um, split time up as equally as possible and let folks know that that's happening. Um, and then, you know, there are some chairs who don't do that at all. However, if you are registered to testify or in line to testify, they have to let you at least say your name um, and whether you're supporting or opposing, um, you know, into the public record, they're actually required to do that. Um, so if you um, sign up to testify on Zoom, and we've had this happen a few times already, you may get to a point where they'll say, okay, we're just gonna go to names and you won't get to give substantive testimony. You don't get to share your story. You just get to say your name and I oppose this bill or I support this bill, but you, they have to, they're required by law to let you do at least that. Um, I would say the, the average is about 30 minutes um, for each side of testimony per bill. Sometimes it's much shorter, sometimes it's much longer. That's 30 minutes of proponents and 30 minutes of opponents is, a, is about average in my experience. Um, and based on that, a couple of things that I would recommend. One, you should be prepared with a two minute version of your testimony and a 30 second version of your testimony. Um, I wouldn't recommend going longer than two minutes really ever, um, unless again, you have sort of substantive um, expertise um, on the issue or you're the only person giving testimony. Um, but mostly two minutes, you know, you hone your testimony down to the most important things and leave it at that. Um, and then have that 30 second, the three most important sentences you wanna say, just have it ready to go just in case. Um, and then I, I do think that if you are prepared to submit written testimony as well, um, you sure can. And it is a good way to um, make sure your testimony gets onto the record in case you don't get a chance or, you know, your internet goes out or something terrible like that happens. Um, I will just note that there are a couple committee chairs who will say, if you've submitted written testimony, please don't read it to us. Just say your name and that'll suffice. You don't have to listen to that. Almost nobody does. So they are, you know, there are some committee chair people who want to keep their hearings short. They don't want to hear from all of us, but, you know, tough cookies. Um, so even if somebody says that at the beginning of a hearing where you've submitted written testimony, you go ahead and give your testimony anyway. And um, in this time of COVID, um, do they always listen to the physical in-person testimony before the online or does it vary? How does that work? That also varies. Um, and again, it's completely at the discretion of the chair of the committee. I will tell you that some committees like House Judiciary is a good example, always does in person first and then online. Whereas House Tax Committee, um, the, the chairwoman is Representative Becky Beard, and she likes to shake it up. Some days she does one thing, some days she does another. She likes to keep it fresh. So you just really don't know. Um, it's a little bit of a, of a toss up um, what you're gonna get.
do folks have other questions or um, I'd actually welcome if other people have tips or lessons that they've learned that folks want to share with the group. Um, I really welcome that. So feel free to unmute yourself and share or put it in the chat if you'd prefer. I have something really quick, Howell. Um, one of the bathrooms has really good lighting. Um, and I think that's important for people to know because y'all got to flex um, those outfits sometimes. So, yeah. <laughs> um, something I noticed was they asked that people didn't have their picture up on their like Zoom screen or um, anything like that, just like your name or your email. And that seemed to kind of take up a lot of time during one of the meetings that I went to trying to get people to do that. Yes, that's a great note. Um, that is also uh, Chairman Usher in House Judiciary. Um, that seems to be a rule that he uh, came up with. The other committee chairs don't seem to care about that, but um, but that is true. If you have like a picture up on your Zoom screen on your background for when your camera is off, um, they want you to take it down before you testify. Um, so the, I, let me make sure I understand the question. Is the question, um, what do you do if you feel unsafe, um, like in the building physically or just more broadly in general? Hmm. Um, so I think that this is a question um, that everyone has to answer for themselves. Um, I, I think that we have to balance uh, how important it is for, um, for all of us to, to show up, whether in person or remotely, um, including as um, queer and trans folks and as um, Black, Indigenous, and people of color, um, we have to balance that with also um, being real about personal safety. So I think um, as with as with many things, um, the buddy system is, you know, just a great safeguard. Um, legislators are less likely to, you know, legislators or other people in the building are less likely to, um, you know, be aggressive or, or um, unkind if you are in a group or with a friend. Um, I also think that there are um, lots and lots of, of um, lobbyists, like um, professional lobbyists or organizers, um, including lots of amazing um, queer, trans, and BIPOC lobbyists who are more than happy to um, like form a group and help out. And I think that, um, you know, making those connections amongst folks is, is really helpful um, in making sure that, um, that folks feel safe. And at the same time, you know, if there's something that, that doesn't feel right to you and doesn't feel safe, you know, you listen to that and, um, and nobody should have to put their personal safety at risk. Um, I will note that uh, nobody has to give out their, their address, their home address, either online or um, in person at the legislature. Um, some people do, and I, I don't know why it's not required. Um, the, the website does ask for an email and a phone number. Um, I don't think they use those phone numbers, so you could put you know, your office phone number or my office phone number for that matter, um, we're happy to take your calls. But you don't ever have to give out your personal contact information um, just as a note on safety. And if somebody asks you to do that, um, that's pretty suspect and you, you should get in touch with, with an ally if that happens. And I'll also just mention that that is one of the upsides to some of the changes that have happened this year due to COVID is people's ability to actually testify remotely. You don't have to share your address, your face will not appear on screen, and you are able to share your story um, from whichever location you please. 
um, without having to reckon with those sorts of issues in the ways that we typically do in regular legislative sessions. And it is true that um, there is not adequate mask wearing in the Capitol. Um, I think that, you know, if folks are um, at high risk, you shouldn't go into that building. Um, it is a really deeply infuriating reality um, that unfortunately we uh, we can't change. Um, so I think everybody, again, those are personal decisions that folks have to make for themselves, but, but know that um, there are lots of people not wearing masks in that building. Um, and if you choose to go in in person, you will, it is impossible to avoid folks. Um, so unfortunately, um, that is true. I will, um, Renata, uh, pages are there in person. A lot of staff are allowed to work from home and a, a lot are, which is really wonderful. And I hope that that um, continues through the session. But yeah, it's, um, it's upsetting what's happening. Um, thanks for folks who've put their, um, put their tips in the comments. Um, and thanks so much for everyone for joining us. Um, we're about at time, so I'm going to hand this over to Ella to, um, wrap, wrap us up, but I just want to say, um, thank you all for joining. And I truly hope that everybody gets the opportunity to engage in this year's legislative session and in sessions in the future. And if you want to follow up with specific bills or issues you have questions about, get in touch with us directly. We would love to hear from you and help um, create opportunities for you to engage. Thank you so much, Howell. Thank you everybody for asking such great questions and engaging so robustly. It's such a, an important topic and something we get asked about quite a bit. So just to round out the evening, if you've attended any of our previous Women's Policy Leadership Institute sessions, um, you will know that we are doing an evaluation. 